Today we're talking about the difference between an Octobox, a Softbox, and a Beauty Dish, and discovering the differences between a Prime and a Zoom Lens. Hey guys, and welcome to Flurn Q&A. Each week we answer questions from the audience. Anything photography, Photoshop, Lightroom related, ask it in the comment right down below. And if we choose to answer your question, you could win a free month of Flurn Pro. All right guys, let's get into our questions. What's the best way to arrange layers in Photoshop? Sometimes my number of layers reach more than 300 and I find it difficult to work. So probably the best part about Photoshop is the fact that you can work in layers. But if you're using a bunch of layers, which I do suggest doing, because that's a part of a non-destructive workflow, they can really stack up. So here's what I do. I don't tend to name any of my layers. What I'll usually do is group layers that are similar. For instance, if I'm retouching a person in my photo, I'll create a group and then put all the different layers in that and then go ahead and close that group out. This way at the end of a workflow, you're left with a bunch of individual groups that you can then name. So it's gonna be really easy to find your place back amongst your layers. Another cool way to separate groups and layers is to right click on the eyeball right next to a group and give it a color. This will color all the layers inside of that group and it's gonna be really easy to stay organized. And I don't mean to brag, but 300 layers, come on. I had 301 once. And finally, if you have a bunch of different layers that are similar, you can also convert those into a smart object. Just shift click all those layers, right click and go to converts to smart object. It'll put them all into one smart object. Then you can always double click on that smart object and open that group up in a different file. Hey Aaron, I absolutely love your great content. So why do prime lenses even exist? I don't really get it. Why should I invest in more than one prime lens to cover my wide angles and zooms when I can have one good zoom lens to cover most of my focal lengths? So prime lenses are basically lenses that do not zoom. So for instance, a 50 millimeter 1.4 lens will always be 50 millimeters. If you want to get closer or farther from your subject, you literally have to walk closer or farther. There's no such thing as a zoom in a prime lens. So if you're only taking focal length into account, you're right, there's no reason for a prime lens to exist. But there's a lot more that's going on inside of a lens than just the focal length. Basically, a lens is just a bunch of pieces of glass inside of housing with a motor inside of it. And the motor moves all that glass around, and that's how you change focus and how you zoom. So to take a picture, the light has to travel through all those different pieces of glass. And each time light has to go through an object, like through some glass, you're gonna lose a little bit of the light due to diffraction and diffusion. It's gonna bounce out the other side and the light quality is going to degrade a little bit. So the more pieces of glass your light has to travel through, the lower your image quality is going to be. By the very nature, a prime lens is a lot more simple than a zoom lens. There's less glass to go through and there's less movement within that lens, which means there's less room for error, which means the final image quality is going to be better than that which you would get out of a zoom lens. For the most part, prime lenses will be sharper than a zoom lens, they'll let more light in than a zoom lens, and they'll be lighter weight and smaller. So I'm not saying that zoom lenses suck. They're great and they're really versatile and I use them all the time. They'll give you a little bit of everything that you want, but they're not gonna be hyper specialized and really great at one thing. It's kind of like an El Camino. It's kind of a car, it's kind of a truck. You get a little bit of both worlds, but it's not gonna be super great at any one thing. Zoom lenses are really versatile, but prime lenses are gonna be really great at that focal length. So if you're shooting with a 24 to 70 millimeter lens, you can shoot at 35 millimeters right in the middle of that range but that 35 millimeters is not gonna give you the same image quality as shooting with a 35 millimeter prime. That prime is gonna let more light in and give you a sharper image than the zoom. And last, from a creative standpoint, sometimes it's really nice to shoot with a prime lens. You're not worrying about zooming in or out and capturing all this stuff. You're a lot more focused on your composition and your subject. So I actually enjoy shooting with a prime because it simplifies the process taking pictures. What's the best way of white balancing your camera? So white balance basically has to do with the color of the light that's in your room. For instance, in the morning, you're gonna have a nice warm glowing light. In the afternoon, it's going to be a little bit cooler. So you wanna make sure that the white balance in your camera is set to reflect the light in the environment so you don't get different colors than are in your environment. Now, one important thing to note is that if you're shooting in JPEG, the white balance actually gets baked into your file. So you can't really change that later. If you shoot in RAW, white balance is just a reference number that you can change at any point in time. So my suggestion is shoot in auto white balance and then shoot in RAW 16-bit and then you can change your white balance in Lightroom at any point in time. That way you don't have to worry about getting it right in camera. This really is something you can change at any time. Just be sure you're shooting in RAW. If you do wanna get your white balance pretty close to the light settings in that room, there are usually settings on your camera. For instance, a sunny or a cloudy or a tungsten light. You can also set a custom white balance 
balance when you can actually dial in a number. For warmer environments, set your white balance around the 4300 range. For cooler environments, set your white balance around the 5600 range. But again, if you're not a white balance nerd, you can just change all this in Lightroom. Hi, I'm Aaron. I'm addicted to white balance. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> What's your favorite color temperature? Man, 4300. Uh, 4300, such a good white balance. <laughs> What's up, Terminator? My question is, what do you think is the best picture style to shoot in? Vivid, standard, neutral, etc. I am the Terminator. <laughs> Terminator here answering your question. Basically, a modern digital camera has a computer inside of it. And when you set those different picture styles, basically it's gonna add more saturation or contrast or sharpening. However, the computer inside your camera in this programming is not going to be as good as raw processing software like Aperture, Capture One or Lightroom. So my suggestion is to keep all those settings completely neutral in your camera and leave all the post-processing to more powerful software. Keeping all those sliders zeroed out is going to make a more flat or dull image straight out of camera, but it gives you more room in post-production. So while they may not look as stunning straight out of the camera, you're gonna get a lot more room to work with, which means you can make a better final product. Hey Aaron, how do you apply sharpening to an image non-destructively? So the big deal with non-destructive editing is you wanna make sure you're always creating layers. That way you can turn them off or on and they won't destroy the original image. Start off by creating a new layer, and then go to image and down to apply image. This will create a snapshot of your image on one layer. Then go ahead and desaturate this layer so it doesn't affect your colors when you're sharpening. Next, go ahead and change your layer into a smart object. This will give you more options when you're sharpening. Then set your layer blend mode to overlay and go to filter, other, and down to high pass. Here you're gonna choose your radius which will apply sharpening to your photo. Now because you made this a smart object, you can always change your radius at any point in time. Simply double click on the high pass filter. You can turn these layers on or off at any time, making them non distracting if you want more sharpening, simply duplicate the layer. If you want less sharpening, lower the radius or decrease your opacity. And don't forget, you can also add layer masks so you can leave part of your image unsharpened and you can sharpen certain areas of your photos like people's eyes. Be sure you resize your photo to the final output size before sharpening. For instance, if this is gonna go on the web and you wanna make it 1200 pixels wide, resize it and then do your sharpening. Because if you sharpen with a full size image and then you shrink that down, your sharpening is going to lose its effect as well. Hey Aaron, can you explain the difference between a softbox, an octobox, and a beauty dish and when you would use each? I need your softboxes, octoboxes, and beauty dishes. <laughs> a softbox is basically used to create soft light. Now you can think about soft light like a cloudy day. You're not gonna have harsh shadows, everything's relatively neutral. A hard light would be a bright sunny day where you can see a very defined shadow. Generally soft light is a bit more flattering on a portrait and that's why we have soft boxes. So basically once your strobe is inside of your soft box, it's going to bounce around the walls of your soft box and then come out of the front. Most soft boxes will also have one or two layers of diffusion material. Basically your light's going to bounce off this diffusion, some of it's going to come through, some of it's going to bounce back inside of your softbox and get recirculated and bounce around and then come out again. Softboxes come in a bunch of different shapes and sizes, and the larger your softbox is, the softer your light is going to be. Some softboxes are long and rectangular. These are called strip boxes. They're used for creating a light highlight around the side of an object. And if your softbox has eight sides, this is called an octobox. Octo is eight eight-sided octobox. The reason we use an octobox is to create a round catch light in your subject's eyes, which looks a little bit more natural, a little bit more like the sun, less like a rectangle reflection in your subject's eyes. But as far as the light coming out of a softbox or an octobox, they're pretty much the same. And last, we have a beauty dish, which is not a softbox. You can purchase a layer of diffusion that will soften it out, but most of the time, beauty dishes are used without diffusion. Now, the big thing that separates out a beauty dish from a regular reflector is that you generally have a piece of metal in the center of a beauty dish. What this does is it blocks the light coming from your light source, making a much more even light source. So you don't have a very bright hot spot in the middle of your light source. Now a standard size for a beauty dish is about 22 inches, which is pretty large, but a beauty dish will create a relatively hard edged light source. So you're getting a large, generally pretty directional, hard edge light. Beauty dishes are generally used for portraits and you wanna get these pretty close to your subject. The farther they go, the smaller they're going to appear and the harder that light will be. So if you want them to be flattering, keep it relatively close to your subject. So if we're going in order from hardest light to softest light, 
A hard light would be a bare bulb light source with no reflector on it. Then we're gonna move up to a standard reflector. Then we'll move up to a beauty dish. Then we'll move up to a soft box. And you can get even softer by firing a soft box through another layer of diffusion. But you'll lose a little bit of the light intensity each time your light has to go through a piece of fabric. Now the deal here is there's no right or wrong. Sometimes a very hard light is exactly what you want for your image. Sometimes a very soft light is exactly what you want. So first, figure out the type of look you want for your image and then choose your light source accordingly. Last question. Do you have any tips for a photographer that gets nervous when they photograph people? So I went through this exact same thing when I first started out. And I think most of it was the fact that I didn't feel super comfortable with my camera, with my photographic abilities, and I didn't want other people to have to suffer through the process if I didn't really know what I was doing. So what I did is I took pictures of myself. I started a project called a 365 day project where I took a self portrait every single day for a year. Now, I'm not suggesting you do this, but I use myself basically as a test subject. So if the images came out great, super cool, really happy. If they didn't come out great, it wasn't a big deal. The only person I was disappointing was myself and I could just take more pictures. This entire process got me a lot more comfortable with my camera as a photographer, and it also got me comfortable in front of the lens. So I could sympathize with people who are actually photographing and I could help them through the entire process because I had learned from being on both sides. So going through that, I got pretty comfortable with the camera and got to the point where I I knew I could take pictures that people would enjoy seeing. And at that point, all my nerves went away because I was pretty confident that if I took a picture of you, chances are that you'll like it. So after taking pictures of myself for a while, I moved on to family and friends. I knew they'd be nice to me and supportive and that helped build my confidence one more step. Then I went on to photograph people I didn't really know. But at that point, I was relatively confident with my own photography skills and everything went smoothly and helped build my confidence from there. Another thing that really helps is the pre-production and planning before a photo shoot. It's really nerve wracking to go into to a photo shoot and not know what you're going to do. But if you plan everything out and you have a very good idea of what you're gonna do, you can even pre-shoot the day before so you know, okay, this person's gonna stand there, this light's gonna be like this, my camera settings are gonna be like this, we're gonna have a great conversation, we'll have a lot of fun. If you know all that setup even before the actual photo shoot, when it comes time for the photo shoot, everything should go smoothly. And the last thing to remember is that the people in front of your camera are probably even more nervous than you are. If you can spend some time getting to know the person you're photographing, just kind of hang out with them one-on-one, -on -one, grab a cup of coffee or something like that, then you're photographing someone who you have a little bit of a relationship with and it should be a little bit more natural and easy to photograph them. All right, guys, that sums it up for this week. Thank you so much to everyone who asked a question. If we didn't get to your question this week, well, there's always next week. Just leave your question in a comment right down below and don't forget every single person we answer is gonna win a free month of Flurn Pro. Thanks so much, guys. I'll Flurn you later. Bye, everyone. Oh yeah, Terminasa. Terminasa out. Hasta la vista, Flurna. I'll be back. Get to the chopper. Arnold Schwarzenegger references. Comedy gold. We've created a monster. Perfect. I think we got it. All right. <laughs> All right. That's a cut. That's a cut.